Hi everyone, welcome to our final vodcast for the research and experiment unit. Today we're going to talk about statistics, so that means we're going to be doing some math, which I know is everyone's favorite, but I will try to make it as painless as possible, I promise, okay? Really, statistics is just a fancy way of saying understanding the data. So in psychology, you collect data, like you guys did with your um, correlations, right? You collect data, which is numbers, and you have to understand that data. What do those numbers mean? Having numbers in a chart isn't helpful, right? So you have to analyze them, and that's what you use statistics for. Now, here's the thing with statistics, right? Obviously, everyone always feels like numbers don't lie, but they can't. Numbers can lie, right, and statistics can be wrong. So if you look at this example right here, it says people injured while driving in New York City, um, and it looks like it's safer to drive under the influence because that only that small portion of people were actually injured. But if you look over here, drunk drivers actually have seven times the fatality rate, but they're only a small percentage of the drivers in New York City. So it looks like driving under the influence is actually safer. It's not because there's a huge portion and there's just a small number of people who drive under the influence. Here's another example of this, right? If you look at this graph, the number of fatal crashes, it looks like 16-year-olds to 19-year-olds and 75 to 79 year olds are the best drivers. They get in the least amount of crashes, right? I don't know about you, but I've seen some 80 year old drivers on the road and they're not the safest drivers. And neither are those 16 year olds that just got their licenses. But here's the deal, they don't drive as much, so of course they have less crashes. So it's very important when you're analyzing data to look between the lines and make sure that you're actually getting what you think you're getting and you're not just reading it at face value. So. How do you use statistics, right? Statistics is math used to organize, summarize, and interpret data. There's descriptive statistics that um, summarize the research for the targeted population. So I do um, research on kids at Mundelein High School, and then I use descriptive, descriptive statistics just to summarize the, re the results that I got from Mundelein High School. Inferential statistics allow the researcher to apply the results to the general population. So it allows you to infer things about people as a whole. So for example, if I did a study about kids at Mundelein High School, I could maybe apply that to all high school students, right? We do this very, very, very carefully, inferential statistics very carefully, and it's only ever used if you do an experiment, right? Cause and effect. Descriptive statistics are used for um, correlations, uh, you know, uh, surveys, naturalistic observations, all of those things. Okay, so there's five types of descriptive statistics, and a lot of them you've seen before. So we're going to go over all five. Okay, so the first one is a frequency distribution. A frequency distribution just gathers and arrange, arranges the data to measure how often a score occurs, okay? There's a couple of different ways you can uh, just, you know, make a frequency distribution. You can make a table, which is this one at the top. You can make a bar graph, which is the middle, or a line graph, right? And all I do is I write the frequency on one side and the other, um, you know, data point I'm looking at, number of hours a week of aerobic exercise or test scores, and I just plot it out, and then I either do a bar graph or a line graph, okay? Here's another example of this. So I have my table here, right? I have the scores and the frequency of that score. And then, of course, I do this. And if I look at this, it tells me that the most common score was a 6. The second most common score was an 8, right? I'm able to see which scores are most common based on, you know, looking at the chart, okay? So it just tells me, like I said, how often a score occurs. Okay, here's something really important to remember when you're looking at graphs. Please, please, please make sure that you actually pay attention to the way they have the numbers distributed. These two graphs look very, very different, except they're the exact same data. And if you look at graph A, it really looks like their brand is awesome. Like, look how much higher the bar chart is, right? But that's because they have 95, 96, 97, 98, and 99 all spread out, right? So if you look at it, our your brand is actually only about a percentage more than brand X, but it looks like a huge jump. And if you go over to B, B is a much more reliable bar graph because it chunks it differently. It chunks it in tens. So you see that their brand isn't actually that much better than X, Y, and Z. But of course, if it's my brand, I'm going to want to look at this chart like A. So you have to be careful when you look at results and really see how they've lined up the numbers on the, on the graph. Okay, the next type of descriptive statistic is measures of central tendency. You've all heard of these before. It's a single number that is used to represent a whole set of scores. So if you guys take a test 
and I want to know what score occurred the most, I would look at the mode. If I want to know the average of all of the numbers on, on the test, I look at the mean. And if I want to know the middle number, it's the median, right? So it's one number that I'm using to give me, to give me an idea of what the whole, you know, 60 test scores look like from both my AP classes. Okay. Now the mean is what most people think of when they want to know what's the most common score. They're like, oh, just find out the mean or the average. The problem with the mean is that it's very sensitive to high or low scores. So for example, if I have a bunch of scores that are around, um, you know, 80%, but then all of a sudden I get a 40, that's really going to pull the mean down, right? But if I look at the median, the median is less sensitive to extremely high and low scores. So you want to use the median is the best uh, way to tell the middle score. Okay, so if you look at this, these are different graphs, and if you look at them, um, you know, distributions can be skewed. So, for example, um, you know, they can either have a lot of pos more results at the lower end of the scale, and they're positive, more results at the higher end of the scale, and those are negative, right? And I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive, so we'll talk about that more in class, okay? But what I want you to know about this is that if you look at this chart down here, this is the income per family in thousands of dollars. The mean is a 70, right? But that's not actually very representative because this seven, um, you know, this 7,010 or whatever, thousands of dollars really pulled up the mean, right? So look at this. It's like this one number really throws this off. What you actually want is probably something like the mode or the median. It's going to be a better understanding of what the numbers look like. So whenever there's a skewed distribution, you don't want to use the mean. You want to use the median. Okay, so now what does a normal curve look like, right? So we talked about the two on the outside and how you want to use the median and not the mean. But a lot of times we have what's called a normal uh, curve. This is where the mean, median, mode are all exactly the same. And so it looks like a U, okay? And um, it's perfectly symmetrical distribution, which means that there's an even amount of scores that fall on each side. So for example, um, you know, if I did a test and the average score was a 80, it would mean that 50% of my scores fell above 80 and 50% fell below 80. Okay, this is called the bell curve or the normal curve, and it looks like an inverted U. Okay, now when you have a bell curve, right, you can actually measure something that's a little more reliable than the mean median mode, and these are called measures of variability. So variability is how similar or diverse the scores are. For example, if I give a test to my second period and my fourth period, okay, and both of you guys get the average of 80, you might assume, okay, both classes did equally as well. But that's not true because you don't know how, how close everyone's scores actually were to 80. You don't know if there was a lot of 70s and a lot of 60s and a lot of 90s and a lot of 80s. You don't know, right? You just know that the average was 80, okay? So what you want to do here is you can figure out how similar or diverse the scores in each class were compared to that 80. So one way to do it is the range. The range is very easy to find. You just take the highest number and subtract it from the lowest number. So if I was giving an exam and the highest number was a 95 and the lowest score was a 65, I would subtract 95 and 65 and I'd get the range, right? And this tells me the wider, the, the higher the range, the higher the number is, the wider the scores. So if my range is 10, obviously I know that that's a much, my, my scores are much closer together than if my range is 75, okay? But it doesn't actually tell you how different the scores are between each other. It just tells you the range of scores. So standard deviation is what you would use to measure the average distance between each score and the mean. So if my mean is an 80 on a psych test, right, period 2, period 4, get an 80. The standard deviation is going to tell me the average number of points between the 80 and each kid. So is it 5 points? Does that mean that it's an 80 and then a 75 and an 85? Or is it 10 points? Is it an 80, a 70, and a 90, right? So that's going to tell me the difference between the scores. And if you look here, the standard deviation on a bell curve is always the same, right? It, it never changes. It's always the same. And there's a certain number on each side. So you have 50% of scores here, 50% of scores here. 34% of scores fall within one standard deviation. Then you have the next 13 fall within two, 2.5 fall within three, right? So you have one, two, three standard deviations, okay? So here's, maybe this will make a little bit more sense, okay? Because I know standard deviation can be a little bit confusing. So here's the deal, right? I have score class A and class B. Let's just say that this is period two and period four, okay? Period two, look, the mean is 80. Period four, the mean is 80. Oh, look, period two, period four, did the, best on the, did the same on the test. That's not actually true. 
Look at the standard deviation. The standard deviation is a 5, and over here it's a 15.8. So if you look at that, that means that um, 38, 34% of students scored uh, a 95, and then the other 34% of students scored a 65, right? So 65 to 95. That means, you know, that's 68% of my scores, right? If we go back to this graph right here, right, between one standard deviation, right? We're over here, since it's only five, one standard deviation is an 85, and one standard deviation is a 75. That means that 68% of my students score between a 75 and an 85, right? So according to this, class B is struggling much more because their scores are much more, are much more spread out. I mean, if you just look at the scores over here, you see that a lot of them are much closer to that 80 than over here. You have 60, 60, 100, 100, okay? So the more spread out the scores are, the higher the standard deviation is going to be. The standard deviation can actually tell me more about how the classes are doing than just the mean, okay? Now here's the deal. This never changes, all right? Whenever you have a normal curve, you do standard deviations. You can't do standard deviations with anything else besides a normal curve. And it's always the middle is the mean, median, mode. And then always 68% of scores fall within one standard deviation, 95 within two, 99.7 within three. This never, ever changes, okay? It's always the same. So for example, if I gave a test and the mean was 80, like I said, right, and the standard deviation was five, that would mean that a student scored um, an 85 if they scored one standard deviation ab above the mean, and they did better than all of the students over here. Okay, what this is, is this is the normal curve for intelligence. In intelligence scores, the standard deviation is always 15. We'll come back to this when we talk more about IQ. Okay, so here's my little cartoon, right? You're three standard deviations above the norm. So that means basically that you're better than 98% of the population. Okay, that's where that, um, you know, on, my, on our sweatshirts from last year, we're one standard deviation above the mean. Okay, the norm is the mean. All right, so another type of uh, descriptive statistic is a correlation. We've already talked about this, okay? You can take your numbers and show how they're related to each other by either doing, it's going to be a negative correlation, a positive correlation, and you're going to get a correlation coefficient. So just remember that a correlation is a type of statistic because it shows data. It represents what the data is. Okay, last thing, inferential statistics. Like I said, if I wanted to take uh, period two and four and apply it to all AP students across, you know, whatever, uh, the state of Illinois, I would use inferential statistics, okay? And I would um, <clears throat> generalize the results by saying that they are statistically significant. Basically what this means is that if I look at the results and I find that the difference between my period two and period four groups is larger than it would be by just chance, right? I can say it's statistically significant. So whenever my results, the difference between my two groups, whatever I'm studying, it has to be large, it has to be less than a 5% chance that my results happen by chance, right? Like literally it was an accident. So there's a less than 5% chance that it was just an accident. And that means that it's statistically significant, okay? You basically have to know that statistically significant means that your results were not by chance and that they actually are kind of proven and replicated and done over and over again until you're pretty sure that it's not just a, it's not just, you know, random that it happened to be that way. All right, that's all for now, AP Psychos. And remember, psychology is flipping awesome.